Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Never go to war with humans. Written by Yo Boss. Professor Elure Irk Bransworth regarded her rather large auditorium, filled with students of many different kinds of intelligent species from all parts of the Confederation. Her hooves slid over the controls of her additional remote auditor feeds that were displayed in the overhead monitor banks to check whether she could start a lecture. Thank you for joining my lecture, either in person for those of you who happen to breathe oxygen and enjoy the merits of a 2G gravitation, or via subspace transmission to a more fitting habitation for your species. For the sole benefit of the shamelessly attracting your interest, I have dubbed this first lesson who we should never go to war against. In this seminar about galactic civilizations and interspecies politics, you will learn about many fascinating races and societies, peaceful, seclusive, aggressive, and expansionist, and of many exotic constructions. Nevertheless, I picked two societies, in this case races, who represent two rather different but nevertheless highest extremes in my proposed frameworks of military conflict success prediction on the scale of the potential of a group or to win the gruesome realities of an interstellar conflict, these two get the highest rating. Klingons and humans, with the later being the most surprising if you have ever met a human. The Klingons are so far the only society who had once gone to war against humanity and survived, for the price of almost complete isolation from the rest of the galactic civilizations. Regardless that they had already conquered half of our galaxy by sheer ruthlessness and the immense capacity for their industrial military power structures at the point in history. Nevertheless, their first military encounter with humanity ended with the loss of all Klingon colonies and worlds that the Klingon Empire had conquered during their past 10,000 years in the span of only five decades. The Klingon cultural aggression is easier to understand because their society is built around the sole purpose of war. Mind the difference. War, not dominance or mercantile suppression, but military conflict as the purpose of society. In Klingon, the word for peace, chaos, weakness, and decay are the same. But the Klingon's single-mindedness and aggressiveness is easier to comprehend, even if it's hard to understand how such a society could evolve at all. The humans practice a much more complex approach. I will come to that later. Getting into a conflict with the Klingon Empire is so easy that every envoy and ship commander has the basic rules hammered into his brain during his training years at the Academy. Do not react to their constant tries to escalate even the tiniest infraction into a war of galactic proportions. They are just too aggressive for their own good, and as long as the Galactic Confederation is stronger than them and integrates with any newly discovered Stage 3 civilization that might come into contact with them, in the future, we are safe, because in their culture, losing a war is exactly the same as being a coward, an offense worth of an immediate self-sacrifice. If we continue to prevent them from conquering new civilizations by elevating any newcomers into our shared level of technology and governmental systems, the Klingon Empire will not grow on its own, because they are not focused on scientific growth or even on colonization. Klingon's purpose in life is to die in conflict. The tendency of the Klingons to fight between themselves is destructive enough to slow their development down to a level where they are not regarded as a threat anymore. Still, I want to strongly advise you against inviting a Klingon to a card game if you want to avoid bloodshed. Let's thank our political leaders that they made the decision to isolate Klingons from acquiring any weapons or technology-related insight from the Confederation. Humans, are, on the other hand, are complicated, unpredictable, adaptive, beyond belief, and it takes a lot of aggression to lure one of them into a fight that could involve injury or permanent damage. And even then, nothing of a large consequence will come of it. Their own and our confederation policing and jurisdiction will sort out the facts. Diplomats deal little punishments and apologies all around, and everyone goes on with their business. Humans are dangerous on a totally different level. As individuals and even as large groups, they are just as harmless as your next regular confederation citizen. They are merchants, scientists, friends, and even some of my valued colleagues are humans here on this Interplanetary Advancement Institute. 
They are so deeply integrated into our society that many forget about their out-of-scale superpower as a race. They have hundreds of thousands of years of experience in the most gruesome, devastating art of small and super-scale conflicts and how to win them by means of adaptation, learning, sneakiness, betrayal, ruthlessness, and scheming. Additionally, they seem to have no inherent natural moral inhibitors against annihilating complete star systems. Growing up, every human learns about their history of the wars and political conflicts of humanity. They learn and they know that they are an aggressive race, even if they do not show it. There are several human sayings that reflect this predisposition. Like, for example, history is written by the winner, or fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. They sound harmless in themselves, but almost every single human is aware that for them, the peaceful civilization is just a loosely connected layer, plastered over an animalistic aggressive nature of their race. Or, as they put it, anarchy is just three more meals away. To give you a historic dimension of how deeply the abyss of their aggression can be, during their technologic ascent, humans eradicated 80% of the species of their home planet in the span of a single of their lifetimes. Not by intention, mind you, just as a side effect of their general attitude towards the survival always has a price. At the same time period, repeatedly occurring worldwide conflicts between them eradicated about 20% of their total population time and time again. In the span of a lifetime, a human possibly could have survived three of those global conflicts, each one of them involving weapons of mass annihilation, ranging from chemical, biological, nuclear weapons to orbital strikes that erase parts of their continents. Imagine a society where almost every second individual was killed by wars at every point in time. They killed each other with slavery, flooding, starvation, mutilation, and mass murder on an industrial level. Altering the climate, withdrawing the sunlight, dropping asteroids, sinking land masses into the oceans, and whatever war atrocity you can think of. For many generations, war and not prosperity was the driver for most of their technological advancements. Again, reflected in one of their sayings, War is the father of all things. Klingons rose into their position of dominance by conquering weaker in their eye, inferior races and societies that had developed more advanced technologies, which were then assimilated into Klingon military industry. Humans fought it out between themselves. They fought wars until they were on the brink of self-extinction on a devastated planet. It is estimated that the biome of Earth will need millions of years to recover from the mass extinction event that the rise of humanity presented to their own ecosystem. They are working now on restoration of their home planet, but so much of the absolute astounding variety of their two billion years of evolution of life is lost forever. Much to their collective shame, as they are putting it themselves. How, you might ask, how can a race that is destructive as humans be composed of such nice individuals as, for example, my lovely colleague Professor Carter from the High Energy Research Facility, who I will meet for lunch later today? In contradiction to Klanons, and most of the other sentient species you'll ever meet, humanity has evolved to intelligence in an ecosystem where they were not at the top of the food chain. Predators five times their size, devastating climate changes, a planet that changes its rotational axis on a whim, asteroids, solar flares of a magnitude that could blast the atmosphere of the planet into space. The liquid core of the planet is heated by radioactive decay processes, leading to cataclysmic levels of toxicity and radiation on the surface. At no point in time, there is not a gigantuan thunderstorm, a volcanic eruption, or an earthquake raging on the surface of Earth. How can humans look at their hellhole of a home world filled with longing for again being able to live under the open sky and enjoy the merits of a simpler times? The rise of humanity as a species that mastered the worst odds evolved could deal out. How can we align with the soft, fun-loving humans individuals that we will meet all over the galaxy? I gave you some hints to the answer already earlier. Humans are aware of their nature and their history. Each and every generation of their young has to go through atrocious amounts of history lessons, and they all hate it that are teaching them about the history of human wars and war crimes. 
I personally believe that they had collectively traumatized themselves by these mind-numbing lessons so that they could avoid all future conflicts for the simple reason to not inflict another year of lessons for their young. <laughs> uh, please excuse my weak attempt at human humor. Humanity has built a unique way to counter their aggressive underlying nature by developing a political culture that is aware of and embraces what lies beyond most of their own conflicts. The inequality of distribution of political, economical, and legal power. To avoid that aggregation of too much power and therefore the ability to benefit from exploiting it, which, due to the nature of humans, leads to aggressive conflicts. Humanity has invented the most convoluted and irritating political system in the galaxy. Democracy. Much to the irritation of all other ruling systems, humans constantly organize so-called votings, where they exchange their leaders with newer, more popular characters, effectively disrupting the efforts of the previous individuals. Many of our rulers' most frustrated, but nevertheless quite entertaining breakdowns when dealing with human politics are based on occurrences where they are at first successfully negotiating with a wise, patient, and insightful elected representative human only to meet a currently most popular beauty contest winner that gathered the most votes behind him or herself the very next week with no other qualification or any other helpful attributes but their looks. The ensuring hilarity and absurdity of diplomatic relations of the Confederation with humanity is contributing to a larger proportion of our entertainment and informational media. So we have a race that is deliberately inhibiting building effective internal power structures because they know what they are capable of if they would gather behind a shared cause. And this is where I have to mention the final, a little sinister aspect why we should love and fear humans at the same time. This chaotic, direct democracy culture is just a layer, like a game that humans could abandon if the need arises. They have neither forgotten their own atrocities of war, nor have they forgotten their capabilities. They are, as they say, two sides of the same coin. They know if they forget about their history, they'll be forced to repeat the errors of their past because of their inherent aggressive abilities. So their young are learning in school of their histories and a morality of wars in a large historic context. But at home, as a relaxational hobby, they play computer games that contain elements of conflicts, battles, tactics, strategy, and the spot decision-making under the lack of context information. Acting in spontaneously built hierarchical structures, usage and economics of training, supply chains, weapons and ammunition, and so many more. These games are immensely popular in the Klanon Empire as well as you can imagine. Most amusingly, in the virtual realm, Klanon military is waging a constant war against a sizable proportion of the human children that spend their free time in a computer game with the name of Total Galaxy Domination. And we discovered that a large portion of the Klanon military is focused on winning this blasted complex, and as far as we know, absolute accurate and up-to-date military simulation to which the Klanon Secret Service has sneakily gained access to. Last time I had to look into the statistics, the Klanons were completely wiped out in less than a simulated year on any of the instances by spontaneous built, rather fragile alliances of human children groups, which call themselves clans, that were at the same time trying to stab each other's backs and have no common internal power structures throughout the millions of different clans. The human youth is having fun simulating the gruesome reality of a universe that is at war with them because of their evolutionary heritage. That is what lies beyond the chaotic civilization, a race that is destined or condemned to finally win against all odds, not to improve but to annihilate anything that is alive and might pose a threat to them. That is what almost every human knows about humanity and what they all fear to become, the final tool of fate when it comes time to wipe the universe clean of all living beings and begin again. Every religion of even the earliest human civilization has come up with a vision of the penultimate scenario to fear. We learn from the humans to call it Armageddon. End of story. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Lord Azrakal, Dragzoon WRE, Holly's sister, Ambrose Cattell, and Quantum Wednesday. Thank you very much.